In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the little corridor out here, just over the name tags, is a wonderful reproduction of the Rembrandt painting of the prodigal son. The original hangs in St. Petersburg, Russia. Beautiful painting. If you haven't taken a moment to look at it, please do so. And during Easter season, we will have a whole class dedicated to the book by Henry Nouwen on the painting and on the parable of the prodigal son. And so, since great masters of art and entire books have been written just on this parable, it is implausible that I will exhaust its riches during the mere 40 minutes that you have allotted me (laughs) this morning. But we'll try. Throughout the ages, one of the ways of interpreting this and all of the parables has been to attempt to see the story through the perspective, through the eyes of each of the characters in the story. What I'd like to do is to save the most important characters for last rather than starting with them, if you will allow me. And let's uh, look at some of the bit players who are still rather important. If we were a part of the um, Academy Award team this morning offering our awards, I would suggest that we would give the award for the most snide character to the servant who is the messenger. We um, acted this parable out in seminary in one of our parables classes, and the man, the young man, Stockton Williams, some of you remember him, who um, actually was, you know, six and a half feet tall, uh, from Texas, a very proud Texan. I went to a cocktail party at his house once, and the ice cubes were in the shape of the state of Texas, so (laughs) very much a Texan's Texan. He got to play the servant. Now, his mother had been in Lyndon Johnson's Justice Department, and because of that, I sort of pictured the way he played this character. It's covered my uh, sense of it ever since that he was Lyndon coming into the Oval Office to tell the president that he had some dirt on Bobby. You know, (laughs) your brother is home and your father has killed the fatted calf. Ever know anyone like that that they just can't wait to share some really bad news? And if it makes you feel awful for having heard it all, the better. Not an attractive character. That may not be the way that it is uh, in the Bible, but that's the way Stockton played it, and I'm just ruined. You know, that's, that's the way that it is for me. It works. Then we would give the next award for the most dutiful, and of course, that would have to go to the elder son, who is oh so respectful, hardworking. He would have been an eagle scout. He would have the perfect attendance pin for Sunday school. He had never in his life been in trouble. In his world, there was one infallible formula. Hard work plus duty equals results. Reward. Of course, those of us who are thus driven have less perhaps than we need empathy for failure which makes that sort of real nuisance to the rest of us mortals. Then perhaps we might ask for the most Christ-like figure in the story. Who would you vote for in that? The father? The father, I think, plays the father, perhaps. So if we want to be Trinitarian about this and not Unitarian, we've got to find the father. And, And where's the son? Father Fleming, my uh, priest uh, as a young man, always used the King James Version of the Bible. And in that version it says, bring hither the fatted calf. And so we just named the fatted calf Hither, right? (laughs) That was his name. (laughs) He also asked if we knew the name of the dog in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. In the King James Version of the Bible it's, moreover. Moreover, the dog would lick his sores. Anyway, is it far-fetched to see Jesus in the fatted calf? The one that is sacrificed 
served at the great banquet. I don't think it's any more far-fetched than in the Old Testament finding Christ in the poor ram with his horns caught in the thicket that's going to take the place of Isaac who's already bound on the wood uh, in the altar for sacrifice for Abraham. I think that when we hear the story of the good Samaritan, we find Jesus in the poor beaten man in the ditch, don't you think? The victim. In the story of the rich man and Lazarus with moreover the dog, <laughs> Jesus is Lazarus, the poor man, the one with sores all over his body, the one that the rich man steps over, the one that is invisible, the one that the world cannot even see. Isn't that the same image that we get when Jesus is on the cross? Is it nothing to you, all ye who pass by? I would say that if we were to search the Bible from cover to cover, whenever you find those that the world considers disposable, there you will find Jesus. Now, to the main characters. The younger son. What words can describe such despicable behavior? What would you come up with? Entitled? Spoiled? Brat, jerk, arrogant, reckless. Look at his behavior. He essentially says to his father, look here, old man. Relationships mean nothing to me. You mean nothing. One only gets one's inheritance when the father dies, and I can't wait for you to die, and you might as well already be dead for me because all I want is the money, and I want it now, do such awful people really exist? How did Jesus come up with this character on the spur of the moment having a conversation with the scribes and Pharisees? I guess he just invented it in the moment. I don't think he stayed up at night saying, how can I come up with a new parable tomorrow? This had to be spur of the moment kind of thing. Is this a composite of all of the worst behaviors that human beings are capable of? Well, in any event, we see that his predictable behavior uh, gives us predictable results. He's given a fortune that will last a lifetime, and he spends it in a very short period of time on the most worthless of things. And then he ends up with nothing during a famine. Good Jewish boy, we suppose, tending pigs. Not something that we would want a Jewish boy to have to do. And then we see the father in the story. Does he represent God the father? I think in many ways, certainly all allegories break down a little bit, but that's who we see. I think for our purposes, as we think about human relationships, it would be fine to call the father the parent or the grandparent or the aunt, or the great aunt, or anybody who has a loving relationship in which love is so strong that even the most colossal rebellion cannot shake that love. Remember um, Bob Dylan's song, The Times, They Are A-Changin'? He spoke the truth when he said, your sons and daughters are beyond your command. Because as parents, no matter how much we wish that it were not so, our children reach a certain age where none of our cajoling, none of our suggestions, nothing that we can offer will necessarily change their intentions and their will. And all we can do is worry and love and hope. One of my favorite quotes from Bishop Ed Salmon was, our Lord Jesus Christ will give us the desires of our hearts, all the while pleading from his cross for the contrary. Sometimes that's all parents can do. And yet, even when rebellion is in full bloom, love flows from that heart of the Father. In the parable, he's looking. I picture him on a porch. And because I'm a southerner, I picture him on a porch with a rocking chair, looking down a long road, day after day, week after week, month after month, perhaps 
year after year, waiting, worrying, expecting, loving, hoping, never giving up. Meanwhile, back at the pigsty, we read that the son, I love it, came to himself. We have a two-stage conversion here, I would suggest. Step one is rather half-hearted. It is a repentance, but I would suggest to you that it is a repentance based on despair at this point, not in love. Love will come. But it occurs to him as he's at his lowest point, hmm, even the slaves back home have it better off than this. I will arise. I will turn around. I'll turn my back on the evil that is behind and face the only love I have ever known and go towards that. That is indeed what repentance means, turning away, turning around, going in a different direction. And he begins to rehearse his very famous speech. Don't you imagine that he rehearsed it a lot? How long did it take him to get home? A week? A month? All the while, over and over and over, every step of the way, one shoe completely gone, as we see in the picture, a ragged, spent young man. Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but treat me like one of the slaves, and that's good enough for me. And while he is a great way off, the father, on the porch, hoping and watching and waiting, sees him, and he doesn't wait for him in humility to make his little march up to the porch and start the speech. The father, long robe and all, leaps from the porch, runs down the road, embraces the son, cries tears of joy, and the boy, like pressing play on the recorder, starts the speech. Father, I'm not, stop it right there. You don't have to say a thing. It doesn't matter. We thought you were lost and found. We thought you were dead and you were alive. And that is full conversion, my friends. This young man is not given a ticket to sin again. He's not given permission to manipulate again, but he has a real change. In his heart, he begins to see what he had never seen before. And essentially what he sees clearly now is, My God, even though I treated him so shamefully, he has loved me all the same all this time. That is a game changer. That is a life changer. And that, is when prodigals who have received mercy grow hearts that can offer mercy, that can offer love. To watch any of those um, programs on TV, Netflix, any of those things where after the episode is over they give you the behind the scenes, what happens next kind of thing. I like to think of the epilogue, the postscript, We know that God does not need help offering his love, the father in this story, but love all on his own. And yet he has called us to be a community to assist, to mediate that love through word, through sacrament, through community, through the tangible offerings that human beings can offer other human beings. But what happens when we have such a community and the snide servant and the uppity elder brother try to crash the party. Try to imagine this. Someone you've not seen before walks through the door and the servant says, did you see who just walked in? And a hundred heads of older brothers and sisters turn, put their hands on their hip and say, my, my, who do they think they are? coming in to this church. Well, perhaps at a church where we have even on our t-shirts, all are welcomed, all are valued, all are loved, that kind of thing doesn't happen so much, I wouldn't think. 
And I think it doesn't happen because we're very intentional to not let it happen because some of us have been on the receiving end of it. And having received it, we know the pain of it and want very much not to give it. So what character do you play in any of these? I, I have to say it, I've more often related to the older brother and he's not that likable. Maybe you have played that role too. I would suggest to you that if we live long enough, we will play all of the characters in this story. And as the curtain falls, the final scene is of the great heavenly banquet table. And the snide servant is sitting at the table with all of the younger son's friends, the unsavory ones that he met on the journey. And the older brother and the younger brother are sitting together arm in arm. And the father smiles. And hither, well, he's delicious. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.